I'm using a lot that I usually use. So I apologize, guys. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Can you guys 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 hear me now? Can everybody hear me? Can you hear me now? Um, can you hear me? Can you hear me? I'm looking at your comments. Sorry. Can you hear me Okay, can you guys hear me now? Can you guys hear me? Oh, you can hear me now because on my screen, it looks like I'm frozen. I'm very confused about what's going on. <laughs> okay, guys, so sorry. I went through this whole spiel. But anyway, um, as you know, unfortunately, um, people in the state of Ohio, witnesses and cases, and please, I'm, I got the comments pulled up now, so let me know if you can still hear me. Um, witnesses in the state of Ohio can opt out of their testimony, or I'm sorry, they can opt out of being videotaped. They can opt out of being on TV for their testimony. And so uh, we, the media in this case, <laughs> observing this case and covering it for so long, um, we noticed in Judge Deering's order that it said, witnesses, it was a long media order, witnesses can opt out of being um, recorded. And he put in parentheses, video and audio. So a lot of us in the media were having covered cases in the state for years and years. I've covered cases in Ohio for 12 years, covered trials. We're like, okay, video and audio, let's, let's clarify this. Because the judge said, if you have a problem with this, you have to file a motion. Guess what, we filed a motion. Because all of us have covered trials in this state for so many years and typically when somebody says i don't want my face on tv we still get to use the audio well judge deering specifically said video and audio in his order i don't know if he actually wrote the order or if the defense wrote the order the prosecution they wrote it together i have no clue but he signed it it's his order so we filed the motion saying look we want an order saying from the court, allowing us, permitting us to to air the audio of the testimony should witnesses opt out of video. We've done it many, many times over the years in many circumstances, in many instances in which a witness objected and we still get the audio. The judge denied our request. So I had a feeling, uh, Bobby Jo Manley, I, ha I knew she'd be the first witness when Angie Canepa said that she was going to go chronologically through this. And um, so Bobby Jo Manley, uh, I'm gonna go through my notes. Here are my notes, I held them up before. Uh, is now 42 years old, so she, that would have made her about 36 or so when this happened, when the murders happened in April of 2016. And she talked about how Chris Sr. had been married to Dana, they were divorced. 
um, we weren't, I'm reading this to you because we weren't allowed to record Bobby Joe's audio. Um, she talked about how Dana was a nursing home aide. She was a, you know, a nurse's aide at a nursing home. Um, she thinks she had, you know, maybe once a week contact with her sister and Chris Roden. <clears throat> and she would go over to Chris Sr.'s um, a few times a week and feed his animals. And um, it was like chickens, a pig. And uh, she would sometimes take her friend Billy Morgan with her. And Billy would do chores for Chris Sr. Um, and he was working off, apparently, buying a vehicle, like some type of truck or putting a motor in a truck or something to that effect. So anyway, they would go over there and do these chores. Chris Sr. would pay them in cash and they'd fill out like a notebook, just like this one that was in the house on, on a speaker, she said, um, in the trailer. And so she would write down their hours in the book, in the log. And Bobby Joe said she was also paying $150 a month rent because she had her trailer on Chris Sr.'s property. So she would work um, for Chris Sr. for some extra money. So she lived in Camp Creek. She said it would take her 15 to 20 minutes to get from Camp Creek to uh, Chris Sr.'s and when she would go over there. So she thinks she said she ride around 730 or so. She said it takes about 15 to 20 minutes to get from Camp Creek to um, to Union Hill Road, where Chris lived. And she talked about how Gary Roden lived there with Chris Sr. sometimes um, because Chris and Gary worked at Big Bear Lake together. And she said he typically had to get up early to go to work. So when she got there um, on April 22nd, 2016, she says she arrived around 730, as I mentioned. Um, his truck was there. She said sometimes, sometimes his truck was there, but a lot of times it wasn't because he would go to work early in the morning. So she said it was really unusual when she got there because the dogs, the indoor dogs, because Chris Sr. had both inside and outside dogs. And we knew this from, you know, covering the case that the dogs were outside. And uh, that was unusual because these were the inside dogs. And also what she said was unusual was the fact that Chris Sr.'s front door was locked. She said that it was usually unlocked. So she's four feet, 11 inches tall. Billy Morgan's with her. She knew there was a key up top on the door frame. And so Billy Morgan pulled the key down and they unlocked the door. She said when, and I, t I wrote these down as direct quotes, um, you know, Chance and Buster, by the way, are the dogs. But she said, um, she said there was a bunch of blood on the front room floor when we saw the crime scene photos and they are, it is quite visible i mean you can tell these are drag marks i mean it's a wide swath of blood you know going from the front of the room to the um toward the back and she uh said Bobby Joe, after saying, you know, there was a bunch of blood on the front room floor, she said they were, she said they were drugged through the kitchen and back to Chris's room. So she uh, walked back there and found Chris dead. She said, I said on the 911 call, it looked like someone beat the hell out of them. Since she called 911, that 911 call was played through her um, testimony because that's how they would have to introduce it. Um, Chris was by his bed on the floor, and she saw Gary by Chris on the floor as well. And there was a comforter over the top of them. She said she got out of the residence, she and Billy, and she was calling 911, and they kept asking for the address, so she didn't know the address. So she walked to the mailbox to see what it was. She knew it was four zero something or four something, but she walked to the mailbox. She said, Billy Morgan, her friend got her mom and dad. He did it on his own. And then she went to Frankie's because she was going to Frankie's to tell him that his father was dead. And she went to the house and the door was locked. 
Um, and I'll let you know, she says she arrived at 7.30 at Chris's. The 911 call was placed at 7.49 a.m. Um, a lot of the jurors, when the 911 call was played, were kind of looking down. That's in my notes. And Geneva Roden, uh, Chris Sr.'s mother, was crying, as were Chris's sisters, Wilma and uh, Teresa. They were both there. So Emmy stayed with her friend Emmy, Emmy Morgan, stayed with her, she said, and held her. Um, she said when she had gotten to Fr when she got to Frankie's and she had knocked on the door, uh, she couldn't get in there. And Brentley, Frankie's three-year-old son, said, who is it? And she said, it's Aunt Jojo. She says that Brentley, her three-year-old nephew, unlocked the door. There was also some discussion about a chain. Like, she thought she did, took, like, undid it with her sweatshirt or something, but she said she was told by the police she couldn't have done that. So she went back when she opened the door and Brentley, um, she asked Brentley, she asked Brentley, where's your dad? And he said, he's in the bedroom. She went back to the bedroom and she found Frankie and Hannah in the bed. And Frankie was kind of, I can tell you, he was positioned kind of like if you were laying in a bed and his face was kind of over this way and one of his arms was over his head. Hannah Hazel was kind of stomach down, sort of on her side, but laying on her stomach and her um, breast was exposed. And Ruger, Frankie and Hannah Hazel's six month old son was in between them and he was covered in blood. And Bobby Joe said that um, that Hannah Hazel had been breastfeeding Ruger because her breast was kind of hanging out of her shirt and uh, the baby was in between them. So um, she said that Ruger was actually on his hands and knees in the blood, in the bed. Imagine that. Um, and she said he was covered in blood. She said they weren't breathing. And she says that she got the babies and got out. I had that in quote marks. Uh, police arrived pretty soon after she said she stayed at Frankie's and uh, outside, of course. And the police arrived and they put Ruger in a squad car. She called Chelsea. Um, Chelsea was the mother of Brentley to come get Brentley. Uh, Leonard Manley was outside with her. Leonard is the father of Dana and the father of um, George Manley and, of course, Bobby Joe. She said, they put me in the police car to ID, ID Dana, but James had done it already. She then gave a statement at the sheriff's office. And she said they took her shoes and her pants. Obviously, the shoes would be important because there were shoe impressions left at the scenes. <clears throat> I'm kind of looking through my notes. I'm confused as to where I left off now. So I turn the page. Uh, on my next page, like going over this, um, uh, she was, you know, asked about the front of Chris's trailer and how the key was above the door frame or on the door frame. Um, animals were kept in the barn. The chickens were kept in coops. She took care of the animals at Frankie's place, uh, is what she said. And the front room of Chris's place had blood on the floor. She said that's, and this is in quotations, this is what I wrote down, that's where someone had drug Chris or Gary through the trailers. Now, it's at this point in the testimony, George Wagner, he's sitting literally kind of in front of me, uh, and, you know, in front of where I was sitting, 
uh, he appeared to kind of look down and at some points he kind of looked over at the prosecution table. He was either looking at, he was either looking at the prosecutor cause she was standing and questioning witnesses or looking at the jury. So it was kind of hard to tell, but I wrote down in my notes that he was looking over at the prosecutor. There are these crime scene photos put up showing Chris and Gary under the comforter and, uh, members of the Roden family, Geneva, Wilma, Teresa, um, they were distraught and they were hugging each other and they were crying. Um, Bobby Joe said she did not move or touch their bodies. And there was a lot of, I felt like there were questions about this journal, the notebook where Bobby Joe would write down the chores that she did in the hours or, you know, however much money she was supposed to be paid. And there was, there was a lot of kind of focus on that. And when I say there was a focus, I just feel like it came up more than once today with both Billy Morgan and, um, and Bobby Joe. Uh, when they showed crime scene photos of Frankie and Hannah Hazel, um, you know, one of the Roden family members was very upset and left the courtroom. And others were sobbing um, because they saw the photos. I mean, can you imagine like being Geneva Roden and looking over and seeing your grandson and his fiance dead? I mean, I mean, a graphic crime scene photo of them in bed, you know, covered in blood. I mean, um, Ruger apparently had blood head to toe and they showed photos of that. Um, Bobby Joe said when she wrote her statement the, at the police department, she was still upset. She provided DNA swabs. Now we move on to the cross-examination. She said she'd been helping Chris with the animals for a long time um, and that he never talked to her about cockfighting. Because remember, we heard that these were cockfighting roosters or whatever, cockfighting chickens uh, that were found on his property. We heard that back in 2016. She said the dogs had a collar so they wouldn't run off. And that the barn, there was a barn that Chris Sr. was building and it was relatively new. She said that she had seen Jake Wagner at the property a few times. Uh, and these are all these are all things that were elicited under cross examination. She said she did not know Chris had a marijuana grow operation, and that she did not water his plants, which I find odd because I thought you know we had kind of been told that back in 2016, but she's saying she didn't know about the marijuana grow operation and that she did not water his plants. She said she didn't know that Chris was in the marijuana business and that he often worked from daylight to dark. He worked at Big Bear Lake. He apparently built decks, did some other things. Uh, at that time, Gary was living with him and there was discussion about a large safe. Chris Sr. and Gary were found kind of in front of this large safe. And when I say large safe, I mean, it was huge. I mean, it, it looked like it took up much of the wall it was a black safe in Chris Sr.'s bedroom. But apparently there was another uh, safe in the closet of Chris's bedroom that was smaller. That safe was gone, uh, according to testimony uh, that came out today. So the safe that was smaller in the closet was not there when the crime scene photos were taken. Obviously the big safe was still there. Uh, she talked about how Chris was a very generous man. This was elicited on cross-examination and that he handed cash out to people if they would pay him back. So if people were hard up for money, they would, he would give them the money and expect to be paid back. Um, she said that Chris worked for Robin, Robin Waddell. That's a name you'll probably hear during the trial at Big Bear Lake. And she was asked if she knew Vance Walls and she said she didn't know him. Um, she said she was friends with Kenneth Roden and then 
John Patrick Parker, George Wagner's attorneys, asked her whether they had ever been more than friends, and she said no comment. And when he asked that question, some of the Roden family members or one of them said, what does that matter? How is that any of your business or something like that? Uh, under cross-examination, she was also asked about how she thought she unlocked the chain at Frankie's house from the outside. You know how sometimes a door has a chain on it. But she thought she unlocked the chain from the outside. Uh, she was also asked about a big 4th of July party or a 4th of, you know, this 4th of July party that Chris Sr. would throw apparently every year with fireworks. She said she didn't know if Chris owned other properties. Um, again, uh, I, uh, as I mentioned, the safes, that's next in my note. The two safes were in the bedroom. The large one was there. Obviously, the other one was not there. She said she can't remember whether she had seen Billy Wagner at Chris's. Um, then she said that her grandson was named after Kenneth and Chris, both of them. Uh, she said that, and then we went back to the chain on the door again, and she said she thought she took the chain off of the door using her sweatshirt. Um, Brentley let her in, so she didn't know if Brentley somehow got up on the couch to undo the chain, but it sounded like she was telling the police she used her sweatshirt to undo the chain, but they, they apparently told her she couldn't have done that. And I remember this, um, I'll just, this is an aside <laughs> just from covering this. I remember Leonard Manley back in 2017 telling me that he felt like the cops were harassing Bobby Joe, um, that they felt like she wasn't being honest with them and that he, they kept interviewing her and giving her a polygraph and all this stuff. So I don't know if they were trying to rule her out. A lot of times that's what they're doing, but I can't answer that question for sure. Um, so I thought it was interesting that this was discussed today, this whole thing about the chain on the door. Uh, next up was Billy Morgan. And he was the friend who would sometimes come to um, Chris's and was doing chores for Chris as well. And let me just tell you, he opted out of both video and audio. And it was very sad. I, I had actually saw him come into the courthouse before he testified, I had no idea who he was, but I saw him very clearly. I, I was kind of behind he and I am assuming his wife who was with him. I, I don't know if it was her or not, but uh, Billy Morgan, I, I saw him very clearly and he was there. And he said uh, he had kind of his hair over his face and he looked down a lot. Um, he seems like kind of like a pretty withdrawn individual. Maybe he's not withdrawn around his friends, but it seemed uh, very sad. And he uh, said it was hard for him. He was asked whether it was hard for him to be in front of people. And he said it was. I mean, he looked down most of the time. Um, he said he didn't know how old he was, but he thought he was born in 1977 in Shelby County. Uh, he and it sounded like he and um, Bobby Joe grew up together and so it was kind of hard to hear Billy at times. He was soft spoken, much like Bobby Joe kind of was, but I think Bobby Joe was easier to hear. Um, Billy Morgan, you can tell is somebody who probably doesn't do a lot of speaking. Uh, he did stuff for Chris Sr. like doing flea dip for the chickens on the property. Uh, and he was putting a motor in a car and he was kind of working off, he was working that off, this putting this motor in a vehicle. Um, I guess Chris had done that for him or he was, Chris was doing it for him or something or gave him the money for it and he was working it off. Um, and he said he would go down to Chris's to do chores with Bobby Joe. Uh, Bobby Joe and Emmy were living with, Bobby Joe or Billy and was living with Bobby Joe and Emmy. They were all living together at the time. He said the dogs were outside when they arrived. Um, and this made me really sad. He doesn't know how to read or write. Uh, he, he said that he can't read or write. 
Um, he said that Bobby Joe would therefore write his hours in the, the journal, the log book uh, that I mentioned before. Uh, Bobby Joe told him where to get the key. As I mentioned, Bobby Joe's four feet, 11 inches tall, could not reach the key, but she knew where it was located. He said that it was uh, odd when the door was opened, when they opened the door, because the recliner had been moved. And uh, the recliner was in front of the doorway, and there were vice grips and a knife on the floor. And he said, usually, uh, we had heard some things about how typically Chris Sr. kept vice grips in his pockets, but they were on the floor, as was this knife. <clears throat> um, said there was blood in the front room and toward the kitchen and that the rugs were usually spread out, but they were in a pile. He went to the back bedroom with Bobby Joe and Chris Sr. and Gary were laying by the safe. Um, he then went to Dana's, or wait, went to Dana's and then Leonard and Judy's. That's what I have written in my notes, but that doesn't sound right. Um, he did go to get Leonard and Judy. He did, Billy did go to get them. But this says went to Dana's and I, I don't know if I messed that up. He must have gone to Dana's though. It says door was cracked at Dana's. He said it was cracked, meaning it was open just slightly. Um, <clears throat> the police took his boots he said, and that left him barefoot. And uh, his boots were taken out of the paper bag in the courtroom and the sole of the boot was shown to the jury uh, over the objection of, uh, not the objection of, but <laughs> George Wagner's attorneys were like, oh, we'll stipulate to that. We'll, we'll agree that to that piece of evidence. They were trying to keep the state from showing certain pieces of evidence, he would say, oh, we'll stipulate to that. So he didn't want uh, the state kind of taking out certain pieces of evidence and showing it to the jury. And the boots were one of those. And then Angie Canepa was like, I'm going to open this and show them the boot. So that was kind of interesting. He was asked about whether he had ever smelled the marijuana on the property. And apparently there was like a green shed where the marijuana grow operation was kept. He said he smelled the marijuana, but he hadn't seen it. Um, he said he used to mow Kenneth's, Kenneth Roden's yard and clean out his well. He cleaned out the weeds in the well one time. And he did that by crawling down in the well. The work he was doing for Chris, as I mentioned, went toward paying off this truck thing, the motor in the truck or what have you. Um, and then this was an interesting point, And I think this is part of the reason the state called him was that he believed that, you know, he didn't say, I believe these are my notes. Billy Morgan is not somebody who's very, um, talkative. Uh, it was hard to hear him. He didn't speak a lot. He looked down a lot. You could tell he was scared, nervous. He said he was nervous. He didn't obviously did not want to be there. He had never been in a courtroom before. Uh, he said there were surveillance cameras like up mounted up around the garage or whatever. And there was like a white block kind of where a corner of the garage meets. And he said, that's where the surveillance camera usually was or cameras basically where the corner they were mounted on the corners of the garage uh, he again said the recliner had been moved when asked and that the knife and vice grips were usually in chris's pocket as i mentioned but they were on the floor right in front right inside the front uh, door of the uh, home kind of by where the blood, the wide patch of blood drag marks were. Um, he said the chair had been moved. It would have been in front of the fan. I, I don't know why that's significant. Obviously it's, I don't know if maybe there, Jake is going to say something about this. Sometimes things come out in trial. They, they mention little things and uh, you don't necessarily know why they're being brought up, but you find out later why it's significant. 
he said there was a motion detector at the property outside and it would make a noise inside Chris Roden's home if it were triggered. Uh, that was an interesting little tidbit too. So basically, if somebody were on Chris Sr.'s property and without him knowing, or you know, if somebody was trying to get on the property, he would know they were there. Um, and this probably goes to this whole idea that Billy Wagner said, I'm coming over to talk about this drug deal or whatever. And so I'm assuming they're going to say that Billy Wagner and Jake and George, I'm assuming they're going to say they knew about the motion detector. So they knew they had to have a reason to show up because they couldn't get on the property uh, without triggering that motion detector. That's kind of what where I think they're going with this. On cross-examination, Rick Nash uh, cross-examined Billy Morgan and uh, Rick Nash was very nice to him. It was actually quite sad. I was heartbroken for Billy Morgan to watch him. Um, Rick Nash said something like when he walked to, over to the podium to, to question him, he said, Billy, are you nervous? And he's like, and Billy Morgan said, yeah. And he said, Rick Nash said, it's okay. He said, I'm nervous too. We'll get through this. Uh, together or something to that effect. So I thought he that was very kind. Um, he said that he knew Chris Roden for quite a while. And when asked how long that was, he said a month. He said he saw Billy Wagner at Chris Roden's driveway. Thought that was kind of interesting. He said that Chris, when asked, Chris would go and again, these were, he was, this was not, you know, these are my notes I'm writing down. This is not a, a quote or a verbatim because Billy Wagner or Billy, pardon me, Morgan was not somebody who was talkative. I will restate that, but that Chris would go to Billy Wagner's car. Oh, excuse me. And talk to him. And sometimes he got into the car, he said. So that was interesting to me. Um, and the defense, you know, George Wagner's lawyers have kind of made Billy Wagner, Billy and Billy Wagner and Jake Wagner, according to the defense, are the real bad guys here. Angela Wagner, also bad guy, I guess, bad girl, bad woman, um, according to the defense. And that George Wagner is not like these other Wagners. Um, he's, they said the defense said yesterday that basically the state of Ohio was conned by Jake and Angela that Angela's a con artist, Billy's a thief, and that Jake got the worst qualities of both of them. And he, they, those three or three peas in a pod and George is somebody different. Uh, next witness also who opted out. This was unfortunate. Actually, no, that's not true. Uh, George Manley was the next witness after, uh, Oh, excuse me. George Manley was the next witness. Dana's Dana Roden's brother. I I really thought that Bobby Joe did a good job on the stand. I also think that James Manley did a good job on the stand. And uh, it made me sad to see James Manley. I mean, kind of made me sad when I saw him out in the hallway waiting to go in to testify. But at the same time, it made me I don't know. I was happy to, when I say I was happy to see him, I don't know this gentleman. I don't know this gentleman at all. I don't know him at all. But the last time I saw him was back in 2017 when he was arrested for breaking a GPS tracker on his vehicle that BCI had placed on his vehicle. BCI thought he was lying about something. And so they put a GPS tracker on his vehicle to see where he was going. At the time, Leonard Manley told me that BCI agents had told him that, that he had gotten a text. Uh, what was it? BCI, BCI agents told Leonard and Leonard told me <laughs> that the BCI agent said that Jake Wagner texted George Manley, well, James Manley, but they call him George, in the middle of the night or the night of the murders. So that triggered some suspicion. So, we never found out if that was actually true. I'm not sure it is really true, to be honest with you. James Zanley says it's not true. 
but he was questioned about it by BCI. Cough drop, sorry guys. Um, so James Manley, I was, that was the last time I saw him when he was arrested for that and the charges were dropped pretty much immediately. Um, so he got on the stand and talked about, you know, where he falls in the lineup of the Manley children. He told his story about what happened that morning and about how he went into Dana's house after being down, um, finding out what had happened. He went to Dana's house. He knocked on the door. The door kind of opened up. And he was yelling for Dana, 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 you know, he could hear Kylie, the baby, the newborn crying. He was going to get Dana to tell her about the others being dead. Dana didn't answer. So he went into her bedroom and tried to rouse her. She was under a blanket and there was a pillow on the bed. And obviously he was not able to rouse her, was not able to wake her. Um, because she was dead and he talked about trying to lift the pillow up off of her head but that it was stuck and um, so he knew she, he knew it was bad and knew she was dead so he walked out of the house he went and got April his wife and told her and said I have to go back and get the baby um, the baby was taken out of the house um, Correct. He did say that. James Manley did say that, but it was something about April's phone too. He had something about April's phone. He didn't, he was, he also, he's a logger. I forgot to mention that part. He didn't work that day. He was not working that morning when he typically would have been gone because it was raining. Oh, hey, JSM. How are you? <laughs> so good to see you, Joseph Scott Morgan. So, yeah, James did say that. I'm sorry that his uh, his phone was out of minutes. So I wonder if Jake tried to text him then. That's a good point. I wonder if Jake tried to text him that night, but it didn't go through. So uh, James had also talked about how he and Frankie did um, like this derby car stuff together. Also, um, they were talking about he was asked about the chickens and a lot of people, a couple of people were asked about the chickens on Chris senior's property and whether they were cockfighting chickens, you know, roosters. And he's James said, well, yeah, you know, they're cockfighting roosters or ch chickens. He said they're fighting chickens because they each have their own cage. So I guess you can't have more than one fighting chicken in a coop or a cage together because they'll fight probably kill it, fight to the death. Um, also, I thought it was interesting, and this this is super interesting to me because I remember this very clearly as well from 2016, 2017, the fact that James Manley, they wanted James Manley's boots, and he refused to give them to the cops as Billy Morgan had given his boots over. Well, James Manley's like, no, I wasn't going to give him my boots because they're brand new their red wing brutes and they were $200, but he allowed the police to take photographs of his boots. And I'm assuming the soles of the boots too. That's very important. So, um, yeah, I just, I thought James Manley did a good job. I thought he did a really good job. I know he hadn't, hasn't spoken publicly about this before. And after that whole thing of him being arrested for breaking the, BCI GPS and all of that stuff. Um, you know, that was a really bad time because I remember Leonard was furious. I should like pull up the story I did, you guys, after James was arrested. I'm going to post those stories in here. Do you guys want to want me to do that so you can late, later watch them? I'm going to search on YouTube for them right now. I'm trying to pull up YouTube on my laptop up here. So 
I thought I did a good job. Um, like I almost, um, I don't, as I said, I don't know him. I said hello to him in the hallway and just said, hi, how are you doing? You know, but I, I felt like, I don't know. I felt like for some, like, I think I've been totally so shy and stuff like that. I was like, wow, he did a really good job. I thought he did a really good job on the stand. Um, I'll look at the stories right now, guys. I mean, this was crazy when this happened. Leonard Manley, Dana, and James's father was furious when this happened. Here, yes. And DCI apparently told him that they were going to, uh, that they were, they would charge him with obstruction. So this is what Leonard said, that they said, we're going to charge you with obstruction if you don't knock it off or if you don't do this. And this is what they told me at the time. Googling, or I'm on YouTube, guys, trying to find these links. I thought that you might want to see these. Sorry, I'm, I'm not talking for a second. Um, again, trying to get this to pop up. I don't know why it's not coming up. I don't want to put it on, um, you know, obviously I don't want to put it on or start searching on the thing I'm on with you guys because then I'm afraid it won't. I'm afraid it won't. It'll shut down my window or something if I search on the tab where you guys are. So I'm Searching for George Manley. <laughs> oh, maybe it's easier if I do it this way. Sorry. Um, Leonard Manley was furious back when this happened, when they arrested George. And he was able to post his bail. I, I was, I don't know who posted his bail, but he posted it really fast. I don't know who, I mean, he must know somebody who could have helped him out with bail money. Here it is. Here's one of the, my one of my old stories about this. About when James was uh, Leonard, and we talked to Leonard outside the courthouse. He was so mad. I'm pasting it in the chat, guys. And. They're probably going to be out of order. Okay, so there's one. This one's, I think, out of order. Okay, so there's one of them. I'm trying to find the other story that I did about George Manley. Finding one of the other old stories right now. This one might not be about, <clears throat> this one may not be about James Manley or this is, uh, this was right after the Wagner properties were served for the first time that we knew of. Sorry guys, I'm trying to, um, trying to find that other George Manley story.
Well, I don't know what, um, I don't know where it went. It's on, it's, it's on YouTube somewhere, but I, we had done a story. I did a story. I thought I did two stories. Yeah, I know. I'm trying to find. I know I did two stories. So let me look for it again. Here it is. <laughs> you guys, Leonard, Leonard family was so mad. I found it. Sorry, it's taken me a long time to find that stuff. Okay, so now I'll tell you about the next witness um, after James Manley. The next witness is James Manley, who testified in because I'm too tired and I hear that. Um, this, it was Deputy Jonathan Chandler. I've met him before. He's really nice. He opted out of audio and video. I was very bummed out. He started with the Pike County Sheriff's Office in 2015. Uh, he was working a day shift then. And he was responding to a call that morning. He had started at 7 a.m. So this call came in at 7.49 a.m., the 911 call. And he um, was responding to the call for two unresponsive, an unresponsive male or males, plural. He was flagged down at 4199 Union Hill Road. That is the address of Frankie, um, Frankie and Hannah Hazel. He said outside was Bobby, Joe, Leonard, and James Manley, um, and Emma Morgan, and two minor children, who he now knows to be Ruger and Brentley. He said the baby was covered head to toe in blood, that the people there were frantic, very ups they were frantic, upset, very emotional. He said, I checked on the kids the best I could. Ruger's diaper, the six-month-old was apparently soaked in blood. If you look at the hospital pictures of Ruger that we saw today, um, they had changed Ruger's diaper. So he was, but his legs were covered in blood. He had blood on his head and um, blood out, you know, blood pulled in his ear. It was actually this ear, I believe, uh, left ear. And I think that's pretty significant because if you think of him laying in, nursing on his mom and he was laying like this as his mom was laying on the bed and she was murdered the blood would have been he would have been nursing and the blood would have been coming down and as he was covered in the blood of his parents it was pooling here because it was likely on the bed um <clears throat> He went, uh, Deputy Chandler went into Frankie and Hannah Hazel's home and he said he observed two individuals partially clothed in their underwear and they were, they were in bed. So they were wearing and they were in their underwear because they were in bed and, you know, going to bed. Um, he could tell they had wounds to their heads and I knew that they were deceased. He said the amount of blood pooled in the middle of the bed was a large amount of blood. He said the male had bruising on his face, and that's probably a, the, the pooling effect of that blood. Uh, if you're laying on a certain, um, laying in a certain way, the blood then pools, you know, and it, it can appear to be bruising when it's really from the body laying in a certain position for a period of time. Uh, the next deputies to arrive were Morgan Music, Adam Ball and Major Tracy Evans, who is now the Pike County Sheriff. He said he worked from 7 a.m. to 2 a.m. So 7 a.m. Friday morning to 2 a.m. Saturday morning. Um, that's when his shift basically ended because he was helping secure things and clear scenes and things of that nature. And it was around that time late at night that he helped carry the bodies out of the house. 
and placed them in a portable morgue. Uh, the defense did not cross-examine him. So he, he was a foundational witness. So there's nothing to cross-examine him on. Um, and then later, a, uh, he was also asked if the TV was on in the home. And that I think is going to be important because they're obviously asking about that. They're like, oh, is the TV on? Like Angie Canepa was asking that. And he couldn't remember. Uh, the EMT who arrived on scene was also asked that question. He couldn't remember. I think it's going to end up being important. It was probably on TV. Or the TV was probably on, I'm assuming, since she's asking the question, leading you to believe that maybe they were just maybe awake. If Hannah Hazel was breastfeeding at the time, breastfeeding Ruger, she was probably awake. So maybe they were killed while they were actually awake. Um, we don't know. But, you know, the timeline they've laid out is that Hannah Hazel and Frankie were killed after Chris Sr. and Gary. So there you go. Um, so, guys, thank you so much for tuning in. Um, we will, I will let you go. Uh, I'm tired. And tomorrow we expect more law enforcement officers. So I'm wondering if we're going to hear from Morgan Music and Adam Ball because, you know, they said they were laying this out chronologically and they would have been the next people to arrive. So again, thanks so much for uh, watching. I will try to post some of the crime scene photos uh, on Twitter. I was going to post the photos of Ruger. I will probably do that now, but I, he's really a really cute, cute baby. And, uh, but at the same time, he's a minor, he's a victim in this case. And uh, he's now seven years old and I would hate the thought of him seeing these photos of himself. I'm sure his, his mother is, uh, or what, well, I'm sorry, not his mother. I apologize. I'm assuming um, whomever is raising him, um, I'm assuming they are keeping him away and the other children are being kept away from this on the news and stuff. So. Uh, Okay, we will talk soon again. Thanks so much, guys. We'll see you another time.